Uh, so now I invite Dr. Kamran uh, to talk about uh, rigid bronchoscopy. Dr. Kamran is a pediatric ENT surgeon at um, ICH Chennai Institute of Child Health and uh, he's trained... CMC Vellore. CMC Vellore. I'm so sorry. Um, he's at CMC Vellore. He's trained extensively at CMC Vellore and at Australia. He is actively involved in teaching students and uh, his special interests are pediatric airway and sleep apnea. So I think I'm going to just focus on the rigid bronch part of it and not put a comparison saying which is better flexible or sir, I think we need to learn both. We need to know use, uh, we need to learn to use both rigid and flexi and uh, choose the right one in the right uh, setting. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into the detail. I'm going to go into the details of the history uh, with the short time, but of course, let's not forget uh, Chevalier Jackson. We're not going to go too much into the detail. We've lost a couple of minutes already. So the three turning points we have to remember is one is cocaine, electricity, and of course, the instruments. That's where the rigid bronze started, end of 18th century. Uh, let's start by looking at this case. This is a typical foreign body, what do you get? A three-year-old, sudden onset persistent cough for one week, no respiratory no, uh, distress, no tachypnea, no witnessed aspiration or choking. And of course, there is unilateral V's and uh, this is what you find on X-ray. This is a, a spring from a pen, from a ballpoint pen. Of course, the common foreign body is the organic, the nuts, the popcorn, etc and uh, the inorganic, the thumb, thumbtacks, the whistles, the nail, the pebble or part of a toy. Uh, the most common are the toddlers who are at risk and uh, unfortunately it's more common in boys. <laughs> there's no e or there's no equivalence in that, it's predominantly boys. And uh, we know it all goes mainly into the right bronchus because of the anatomy. and. Uh, so again, it depends on the say size, shape, the surface, the degree of up obstruction and the tissue reaction to the foreign body. And uh, the dangerous ones are the ones who have a very smooth surface, which are round like a marble. There it is. And expandable like popcorn or any seed. And of course, the large and slippery ones like a seed, which is difficult to grasp on too. And then what happens next? So, of course, we have our anxieties. We've always, uh, some of us have been in situations uh, which we will remember and which gives us an anxious moment when we think of. So, initially, it's the period of choking, gagging, asymptomatic phase where the foreign body goes down mainly into the right, sometimes onto the left, and then the complication phase where the organic foreign body it swells up, causing partial or complete obstruction and uh, the long-standing ones in the tracheobronchial tree will cause edema, secretions, etc. So this is a 14-month-old with a horse cry who was uh, going from a hospital to hospital, went, for multi went through multiple hospitals for about a month. The croup was, wasn't settling. So was seen by ENTs, was seen by pediatricians. But simple thing is no one did a nasendoscopy. So when you do a nasendoscopy, so this is the kid, we, I don't have the nasendoscopy video of this, but what we could see is a, a black foreign body stuck in the glottis. So we went in, took the foreign body out. This was a piece of a toy. The child's brother was playing, something broke off and this baby put it in her mouth. And then this is what happened. So I'll just try to speed it up. So that's the end of it. Have a look to see if there's any second foreign body always. So this is coming to if the foreign body is in the larynx, the patient will have hoarseness, aphonia. Uh, usually there will be uh, sudden total or near total obstruction, uh, discomfort in the pain and often this mimics croup. So you have a small kid, atypical croup, please do a nasendoscopy or a flexible laryngoscopy to look at the glottis. This is Let's go a little further down. Uh, this is a 12-month-old, again, semi-witness choking. Mom is not sure what the child choked on. The child came with strider and cough and had moderate work of breathing, had subcostal and intercostal retractions. And uh, this is what we found. So we went in, there's a piece of plastic stuck in the subglottis and the upper trachea. That's a pretty sharp, sharpest foreign body which was stuck 
impacted in the mucosa took some effort to get it out and then we put the child on post op steroids so if it's in the trachea usually the presenting symptom would be cough and for example in this one there can be hemoptysis as well and of course so jackson jackson and jackson described three signs if for a tracheal foreign body one is asthmatoid wheeze sometimes it can be strider like in our case where it was higher up so you can have a biphasic strider and an audible slap the foreign body is uh, hitting across the trachea slapping the tracheal wall and all, of course a palpable thud when you keep your hand over it and uh, this is another case this is a 14 year old new onset asthma was treated unresponsive to uh, asthma medications for 6 uh, months so the pediatrician were finally got suspicious and decided to do an x-ray so this is what was there on x-ray so there's a radio opaque foreign body in the right main bronchus so apparently when i spoke to the child child said he was too embarrassed to say that he swallowed a, a thumb tack so that was the foreign body so that's why he did not tell so and he totally forgot about it much later so if it is in the bronchus the presenting symptom would be cough unilateral breathe uh, wheeze and you may find decreased breath sounds in only about 57% as per this paper so it does not exclude a foreign body if there is equal air entry still you should go history is the most important thing and again depending on types of bronchial uh, obstruction the bypass the check valve the stop valve and the ball valve i'll not go into details of it you all know about it Uh, and of course the complications the immediate complications um, asphyxia uh, early obstruction and of course the late complications that is recurrent pneumonia bronchiectasis as and lung abscess so this is a 3 year old with recurrent pneumonia for 4 weeks unresponsive to antibiotics and uh, left lung showed consolidation and no radio opaque foreign body so this is again a, a telescopy so where we found the thick secretions in the left main bronchus we could not identify a foreign body with the telescopy the initial telescopy with the hopkins rod endoscope and then we went in with a rigid bronch so where we could do suction squirt some adrenaline and finally we see the foreign body this is a small kid and uh, i think we took the fo foreign body out with a non optical forceps i don't have the foreign body removing bit of it in it uh the key is i'm going to come back to it again i have a video to show that so when you have a, a patient with a foreign body with a consolidated or a white out lung on one side please remember that there will be secretions behind the foreign body so always try to pass a suction uh, pass the foreign body clear the secretion suction out everything before you take it out otherwise if you the moment you see a foreign body we are excited especially when we are early in our career we grab the foreign body pull it out then what happens the secretions will flood out the other lung as well and the patient will desaturate so you will get into situations which you do not want to get into so diagnosis how do you uh, diagnose someone with a foreign body bronchus or foreign body airway so one is it will be sudden onset paroxysmal cough choking may be supervised may not be unsupervised usually in toddlers and um, it's usually while feeding or while playing with small objects so that is again you have to ask the parents is if was the child eating something was the child playing with something or playing at a place where where are small things like for example tiny lego blocks etc and of course high index of suspicion should be there in children with new onset asthma like symptoms new onset lower respiratory uh, infection symptoms which are not responding to appropriate treatment and of course unilateral wheeze is a red flag don't miss that and clinical findings again decreased breath sounds not always but most of the times yes features of collapse emphysema all these are unilateral and of course please look for a a double halo sign if it's a button battery especially in our country we do see kids with lot of swallowed button batteries uh, the most common inve investigation what we do is uh, an x ray it's a simple x ray and especially in uh, little older kids please ask for a inspiratory as well as as well as an expiratory uh, film so normally you see about 65% is normal you can pick up things only on 35% but of course 
radio uh, or radiology is not the gold standard you have to go by your clinical suspicion your clinical judgment and of course gold standard is bronchoscopy rigid or flexible whichever you have at your disposal and um, of course on lower airway if there are radiological changes if it's not a radio opaque foreign body it will be a hyperinflated on one side may show mediastinal shift or on the contrary may have atelectasis depending on the type of obstruction whether it is a ball valve or uh, then again bronchiectasis consolidation in long term foreign body so this is a picture of a inspiratory as well as expiratory film so you see this is one side is hyperinflated lung again other investigations are there but again the gold standard is bronchoscopic rigid or flexible so coming to rigid bronchoscopy the numerous uh, bronchoscopes are different they come in all shapes and sizes but how do you choose the right one so one is simple you want to do the old school way look at the outer diameter of the age appropriate tube for example use age plus 4 by 4 formula and uh, pick up the endotracheal tube turn it over look at the package look at the outer diameter of the endotracheal tube then go back to your bronchoscopes look at the outer diameter of the bronchoscope so use a comparable a bronchoscope of comparable size so that's the old school way of course uh, there are many uh, airway sizing charts i think the oldest is uh, by the great ormond street uh, this is one of the australian surgeons who's modified it uh, eric levi and these are all online you can easily find it you can just look for the great ormond street uh, pediatric airway sizing chart and these are some of the apps so one is by uh, the cincinnati group but they don't have the bronchoscope sizing in it so this is one by the thailand uh, university so it's called as a pediatric airway sizing so if you look up on play store or app store you'll find it in both android and apple so you select the bronchoscope sizing and you enter the age and it will give you what size bronchoscope to use so this is for people like me where we don't want to do the math so it's a lot simple to just enter the age on the phone and it will throw out uh, the size so again these are the the bronchoscope sizing chart and of course uh, two things to remember is the lens so there's certain change in the length as well the more uh, bigger the bronchoscope you go to the length increases and uh, you have two lens for 3.5 that is you have a 20 and a 26 and you have again for 26 and 30 uh, you have these these uh, uh, sorry this one so four size also comes in two lengths four and 3.5 so 3.7 uh, i don't know we don't find it in india so it's only 3.5 and 4 what we find but in australia they used to have uh, 3.7 as well if you look at the pediatric bronchoscope uh, leaflet by store so this is this looks quite complicated if you zoom into it it gives with different part numbers so trust me this is important so you need to know the right part number when you order because for a pediatric bronchoscope set there are a lot of mixes and combinations like so only a certain part would go with a certain bronchoscope and a certain telescope so the length is 26 then you have a hopkins rod telescope you need to know the length you know to know this length you need to know the the bridge number and its length and of course this is a prism this is a, a fluvog if you all know if you've used the bronchoscope and uh, this is a small uh, uh, ready reckoner which I usually have so which size telescope goes in which size which length bronch so for the bridge if you're using bridge and of course the side attachments so especially for the beginners I try to I'll try to simplify it a bit uh, I know you all know, do regularly bronchoscope is rigid bronchoscope is, is not for you this is for the younger crowd so you have a rigid bronchoscope it has the distal tip the proximal uh, part and it has a, a port side port for the prism and another side port for the anesthesia uh, circuit and there's a fourth <laughs> port which is called as a suction port so this is suction port this is where this cap goes in so you can pass a five french infant feeding tube or if you have a lot of money you can order one suction tube from uh, stores uh, what I use is I use a 5 French uh, feeding tube so that works very well this is the light source prism this light source uh, it comes separate 
you can also use the one which is uh, part of your Parsons uh, prism. So the same thing fits in here as well. So if you're Dr. having... Uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Kamran. Tomorrow in the uh, workshop, you are going to demonstrate going to all this. You are going, going to, to show them. everything and uh, explain okay. it. Dr. Okay. Sandhu is online already. Okay. So maybe we can have a, a good uh, discussion sure. of uh, I'll, I'll skip all these things. Then. Yeah, please. Okay. Thank you. So I'll skip through this. So other thing is airways a shared corridor. So it's not just enough for you to know your bronchoscopes. Your anesthetist should also know what you're doing. He should know your instruments. It's after all a teamwork. So when you use a Parsons, they need to know where to connect the oxygen. And when you're using a there, and uh, when you're using a rigid bronchoscope, they need to know where to connect the, the circuit. So at least this bit, your anesthetist and your assistant should know. Your assistant also should know when to pass the suction from the side port. You should already have set it up, but when to connect the suction, when to flush uh, some adrenaline or when to flush some lignocaine that they should be aware of. So this is a video just to highlight how uh, things should work hand in hand. So he's using a flu gov, uh, sorry, flu uh, to see. This is a smaller kid. So he's going in and uh, so just see the anesthetist knows where to connect the circuit. So there is no loss, there, there's no time lost to figure out the anesthet the assistant is helping the surgeon take the Parsons uh, laryngoscope out and then they already changed to a, they, they've got the Hopkins rod uh, endoscope telescope ready to go through the, <coughs> to the, through the silicon button and then you see the foreign body. And then the suction is passed, the secretions behind the foreign body are uh, secreted out or cleared out. And now there is a changeover. So the, the assistant could change over to a optical grasping forceps from a Hopkins endoscope. So this shows how the teamwork is between the, the surgeon, the anesthetist as well as the assistant. So it's like a smooth, uh, synchronized working. And the foreign body is out. And then you do a check scopy to confirm there's nothing left behind. So I'll just run through this. And then as he's coming out with the bronchoscope, the anesthetist is ready with the mask and takes over without any lapse in time in between. Okay. So other things we have is the foreign body forceps or the optical and non-optical. Non you get the same ones optical and non-optical. If you can look at it, there are three main forceps. One is the, the tip has two to. This is good to remove some flat coin like structure. This is a peanut forceps and this is an alligator forceps to remove piece of plastic or for that example, a whistle. <laughs> and uh, the safest way is choose the right forceps. For example, if there's a spherical thing or like a peanut, Use a peanut grasping which can remove it atraumatically. And uh, I'm sorry, this is another one last video before we wind up. So, this is I think the case 3, the thumbtack which I'd showed uh, on x ray, the 14 year old with 6 month history. So, I think this were a little, we are a little worried because this was there for more than 6 months. So, he had a lot of granulations. So, first is a check telescopy with a Hopkins uh, endoscope. Uh, then I'll speed it up a little. Then I pass a suction behind it, suction out, clear out the secretions behind, and also with the same tubing, squirt a little bit adrenaline around. So, what it does is it reduces the bleeding as well as it causes a bit of bronchodilatation. You have little more space to grab things. So, then with an optical forceps, we remove the foreign body. I'm just uh, skipping through this and then at the end have a check scopy, see if there are any granulations. If there are any granulation, you can squirt some uh, ciprodex or some uh, dexamethasone or hydrocortisone into the lumen and come out. Of, of course, the other things are like baskets and uh, balloons which 
which uh, Mark already explained. So even you can use them in rigid as well. It can be as part of a hybrid scopy or even purely rigid. If you've got an impacted uh, foreign body which you can't really grasp with any forceps, you can use a basket or you can pass a balloon behind it and dislodge it and then take it out with a forceps. And again, the key point is choose the right size, know the right combination, the braids, the scope, that bronchoscope. And uh, other thing what most of us don't realize is when we use optical forceps, the bronchoscope, uh, bronchoscope size should be bigger than 3.5. Uh, so it has to be at least a 3.7 if uh, available or a 4 size. Anything smaller, one is it's difficult, it's very snug fit, you can damage your optical grasping forceps. Second thing is you won't be able to oxygenate the patient well because that will like, occupy most of the lumen. Third is remember to suction behind the foreign body, especially if there's consolidation or a long-standing foreign body. Uh, make good use of the suction side port and uh, don't forget teamwork. Thank you. And I'll leave you with some interesting foreign bodies from last few years. So this one is quite interesting. This is two ball magnets, one on either side of the epiglottis. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kamran. Very interesting talk. Um, Thanks.